Welcome to worship this morning. Um, just want to highlight a few announcements. The flowers were given by the Wynn and Prater families in, in honor of their, uh, of, of Chick Shannon. And uh, Maxine did a wonderful job of arranging them. Not, and not Maxine, um, Lynn. Lynn did a, where's Lynn? There she is. Lynn did a wonderful job of, of arranging them. Um, next Sunday is All Saints Day, so let me know if you have a family member, a friend, or someone that, you, that has died since last November 1st that you want recognized in the service. Um, name printed in the bulletin and all that. Um, please get it to me by Wednesday. Um, the, our volunteers print the bulletin on Thursday. You'll, you'll notice that there's a poinsettia insert, and uh, Karen wants those orders by the 17th of November. With that, I turn it over to Carol. Thank you, Carol. Good morning. Morning. Would you please join me in this morning's call to worship? It's printed in our bulletins. Our God is Alpha and Omega, who is and who was and who is to come. Almighty God is sovereign over all creation, including us. Let us worship our God with deep reverence in this hour. We bring, we bring our, our concerns, concerns for, for today, today and, and our, our hopes, hopes for, for the future. future to God, God this morning, morning hoping to be renewed in God's presence and to rejoice in God's love for us and to love God in return. And would you please also join in the singing of this morning's opening hymn, The God of Abraham Praise, number 116, and also projected on the screens. And please stand to sing if you wish.
893 that we might join in the prayer of confession. Um, it's a responsive prayer of confession. We're going to skip uh, the first two lines. Number 893. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, we have built up walls of prejudice. Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, we have stifled generosity and left little time for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us to listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come, fill this moment, and free us from sin. I invite you to add a silent prayer of confession. Hear these words of assurance. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive all your sins through Jesus Christ our Lord. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Greg will share with us the gospel lesson and part of the lesson of Job. This morning's gospel lesson will continue with the gospel according to Mark. Chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. When uh, blind Bartimaeus receives his sight. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. And we'll follow our gospel lesson with the first part of our Old Testament lesson from the book of Job, chapter 26, the first six verses. I'm sorry, for number 27, the first six verses. And Job continued his discourse. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice? The Almighty who has made me taste bitterness of soul, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, and my tongue will utter no deceit. I will never admit you are in the right till I die. I will not deny my integrity, till I die I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. Continuing now from, uh, from Job chapter 27, excuse me, from Job chapter 29. <clears throat> Job continued his discourse. How I long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house, when the Almighty was still with me and my children were still around me. Whoever heard me spoke well of me, and those who saw me commended me because I rescued the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to assist them. The one who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. 
I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their, their teeth. People listen to me expectantly, waiting in silence for my counsel. I chose the way for them and sat as their chief. I dwelt as a king among his troops. I was like one who comforts mourners. Here ends the reading from Job 29. I invite you now to stand and sing with me if you are willing and able. There is a wideness in God's mercy, number 121. Today, I want to focus on the book of Job again. Remember in Job chapter 1, verse 1, Scripture tells us that, that Job was a blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And recall that God himself said to Satan in that same chapter, Have you considered my servant Job? There was no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And then God allowed Satan to afflict Job with many severe losses to see if he would trip up and curse God or deny his faith in God. What I have not discussed the past two weeks is how Job's friends, after sitting silent with him for seven days, then proceeded to attack Job, saying he must have sinned in various ways, and therefore he was just getting what he deserved. Eliphaz, the first of Job's friends to speak to him, summarize their argument in Job chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. In fact, most of the book of Job is his friends saying he must have sinned and Job protesting that he has not. This past week it occurred to me that between Job chapter 29 and Job chapter 31, we have a portrait in the Bible of what God considers to be a good man. And that, my friends, is worth taking a look at. First, I'm going to read Job chapter 31, Job's final words to his so-called friends, and then review the characteristics of a good and godly man or person, as we find mentioned in chapter 29 and 31. So here we turn now to the reading of Job 31, and this is Job to his last offense to his so-called friends. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. For what is our lot from God above, our, our heritage from the Almighty on high? Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? Does he not see my ways and count my every step? If I have walked with falsehood or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales, and he will know that I am blameless. 
If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then may my wife grind another man's grain, and may other men sleep with her. For that would have been a wicked, that would have been wicked, a sin to have been judged. It is a fire that burns to destruction. It would have uprooted my harvest. If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I, I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I, I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece from my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint. For I dreaded destruction from God. And for the fear of his splendor, I could not do such things. If I have put my trust in gold and said to pure gold, you are my security. If I have rejoiced over my great wealth, the fortune my hands have gained. If I have regarded the sun in its radiance, or the moon moving in its splendor, so that my heart was secretly enticed and my hand offered them a kiss of homage. Then these also would have been sins to have been judged, for I would have been unfaithful to the God on high. If I had rejoiced at my enemy's misfortune or gloated over the trouble that came to him, but I have not allowed my mouth to sin by evoking a curse against their life, if those of my household have, have never said, who has not been filled with Job's meat? But no stranger had to spend the night in the street, for my door was always open to the traveler. If I have concealed my sin as people do, by hiding my guilt in my heart, because I so feared the crowd and so dreaded the contempt of the clan, of the of the clans that I kept silent and would not go outside. Oh, oh, that I had someone to hear me. I, I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on as a crown. I would give him account of my every step. I would present it to him as to a ruler. If my land cries out against me and all its furrows are wet with tears, if I have devoured its yield without payment or broken the spirit of, the t of its tenants, then let its briars come up instead of wheat and stink wheat instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. At least they're ended to his friends. So first of all, a good man, a godly person, cares about God. In Job chapter 29, Job talked about God watching over him and God's intimate flesh, friendship blessing his house, meaning his, his family, his household, all he had. In Job chapter 31, he makes it very clear that, that he has not trusted in his great wealth for his security, but rather in God. Job also makes it clear that he has not worshipped the sun, moon, and stars as many did, for as Job said, that would have been a sin to be judged, for he would have been unfaithful to God on high. So Job was not guilty of idolatry, of unfaithfulness to God by worshipping false gods, whether wealth or power or prestige or any other false god. Job cared deeply about his relationship to God, and he cared deeply about his family and their well-being. 
As a good man, Job was also faithful to his wife, the wife of his youth. He had intentionally made a promise to himself and to God, I believe, this covenant of his eyes, not to look lustfully at a young woman. Job did not abuse his status in the community, his position of power and wealth to pursue or abuse young and or beautiful women. Instead, Job was very aware that God could see all that he did, even in the dark. And he even invoked, invoked a terrible curse upon himself, saying, if my heart has been enticed by a woman or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door ostensibly to have sex with his neighbor's wife, then Job said, may, Job said, may my own wife sleep with other men, for that would have been a sin. That would have been a sin to have been judged. So Job was faithful, it seems, sexually to his wife, not only physically, but in his heart, and certainly did not try to grab and molest other women. As a good and godly man, Job also did not deal with lies and engage in deception. In fact, he challenged, he challenged God to examine him in this regard. In Job chapter 31, verse 5 and 6, we heard Job say, if I have walked with falsehood, or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales, and he will know that I am blameless. Friends, a good man, a godly person, does not traffic in lies and slander and deception, nor fear fact-checking from God or anyone else. Job was a man of integrity, and honesty. Furthermore, a good man, a godly person, will generally have a good reputation, although it is true that that reputation may at times be slandered or smeared by ungodly people for their own wicked purposes. In Job chapter 21, 29, verse 11, he asserted this, whoever heard me spoke well of me, and those who saw me commended me. A good person's leadership is normally respected, or at least it should be. In Job chapter 29, verse 21 and 25, Job said, people listen to me expectantly, waiting in silence for my counsel. I chose the way for them and sat as their chief. I dwelt as a king among his troops. Now, Job was not a king. He was just a rich, you know, respected leader in his community. But there Job was talking about being honored and respected for his, his guidance and his wisdom. And friends, in Job chapter 29 and 31, it is clear that Job's leadership was respected and valued in his community, not only because of the words he said, but also by what Job had done to earn the respect of people due to the justice and compassion and integrity by which he lived. Hear again what Job said on this topic. Those who saw me commended me because I rescued the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to assist them. Those who were dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. That would take some effort, wouldn't it? The one, and then he said, I put on righteousness as my clothing and justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. Folks, did you notice who Job, as a rich and powerful man in his, in his society, said he helped? It was the poor, the needy, the dying, the widow, the blind, the stranger. Notice that Job's concern and care was offered to the most vulnerable and needy in his society and not to rich people or businesses. In fact, Job said he went beyond helping the poor with charity. He actively worked against injustice to stop oppression, to rescue those who were being oppressed. We heard that in Job's assertion when he said, I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. H.H. Raleigh, in his commentary on Job, says this. 
Job used his strength and influence not for selfish ends, but for righteousness. It was particularly in legal suits that the poor needed protection. And it was here that Job gave his aid. He not merely relieved distress, but undertook the harder task of securing legal justice for the helpless. Job claims he not merely rescued the weak from the ruthless, but he broke the power of the oppressor to injure anyone else, end quote. Friends, those were the actions of a good and godly person who went to court to help the weak rather than to cheat them out of their wages or to falsely accuse people of wrongdoing. By the way, did you also notice Job 29, that where in Job 29, verse 16, where Job said this, I took up the case of the stranger. Marvin Pope, in his commentary on Job, notes, and I quote, Solicitude for the stranger, as for the widow and the orphan, is enjoined repeatedly in the law, meaning the Old Testament law. And Pope cited Exodus 22, verse 21, as one example of this. And that reads, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Friends, that was God himself telling the, Jew, to the Jewish people to treat foreigners in Israel like they themselves would have wanted to be treated when they were slaves and sojourners in the land of Egypt, where indeed they had been enslaved for 400 years. In addition, as a good and godly man, Job recognized his servants as fellow human beings. He recognized that they were created by God and should be treated with justice, even if the rights they, they had were not recognized by the society of his day. Recall that Job said this, If I had denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not God who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form both of us within our mothers? My friends, it is important to remember that our ultimate judge is God and not the laws and the courts of this country or which may themselves sometimes be unfair, unjust, even immoral in God's eyes. Job, as a godly person, clearly recognizes that. And he declared this curse on himself. If I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let it be broken at the joint. But Job knows that he did not act in that way, and, and, he, and he tells us why. He said, for I dreaded destruction from God, and the, for fear of his splendor, I would not do such things. Friends, the Bible teaches that the ungodly have no love for God or fear of God, and therefore engage in all sorts of wrongdoing and injustice, violence, and evil. But a godly man, or a, a godly person like Job, recognizes the common humanity of people and, and does not call them animals or worse, or treat them as such. Instead, he or she recognizes the lowest members of society, even foreigners, even immigrants, as people created by God and, and treats them as having inherent worth and dignity. Another very important quality for a good and godly person to have is generosity. And Job was very generous. Job gave food and clothes to those in need and hospitality, the hospitality of his home to strangers. But Job went beyond caring for people's physical needs to also trying to be of some emotional support to them as well. He mentions widows and orphans in particular. Recall that that Job said of himself, from my youth, I reared them as a father would. And from my birth, I, I guided the widow. Which was Job's way of saying that all his life, he had endeavored to help the most, the most 
and need people in his society, those most in need, the widows, the orphans, and give them not only his physical, financial support, but also emotional support, guidance as well. It would have been a very difficult thing to be a widow in ancient society, no social security. You know, many widows in that position in those days had to, had to turn to prostitution to support themselves. And here is Job saying that he was guiding them, helping them. As a good and a godly person, Job even asserts in chapter 31, 30, 29, and 30 that he had not rejoiced at his enemy's misfortune or gloated over the trouble that came to them. He, he declared, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by invoking a curse against their life. I don't know how many of us could say we never missed, uh, that we never wished misfortune on anybody. About this verse, H.H. H. Raleigh writes, and I quote, The Old Testament law enjoins one to help one's enemies, and the same spirit is commended in several proverbs. The psalmists, however, fall below this spirit and show fierce hatred of their enemies, at least some of them do, or exult over their misfortune. And, and the low point of that would be the psalm, I don't know what psalm it is, where, where the psalmist writes that, you know, I hope their babies are dashed against the rocks. However, Job, Job declares that he has never, ever in his heart found pleasure in the ruin of his enemies. Another scholar, Ding Doom, observes this. If Job 31 is the crown of all the ethical development of the Old Testament, then verse 29 is the jewel of that crown. Verse about not even wishing ill on his enemies. Before Job ended his recitation of the righteous and compassionate actions he has taken, Job also implied that he had not tried to hide his guilt about anything, either from God or from other people. And he calls upon God to hear him and to write, and, and to, to write up any charges against him. As a good and godly man, Job had tried to think and to live right. In fact, and I quote, Strom observes that the picture that Job, the picture Job here presents of himself is extraordinarily like that of a citizen of God's kingdom, as etched by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Job goes beyond act to thought and beneath conduct to the heart. End quote. Friends, let us contrast this portrait of Job as a good and godly man to one of several portraits of a, of a bad man. One, and we're going to use Psalm 52. And then I want us to ask ourselves, who do we want to be like? And what kind of men and women do we want to lead our nation? Psalm 52. Anon, uh, maybe attributed to, I think it's attributed to David. It doesn't really matter. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty hero? Why do you boast all day long, you who are a disgrace in the eyes of God? You who practice deceit, your tongue plots destruction. It is sharpened. It is like a sharpened razor. You love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than speaking the truth. You love every harmful word, you deceitful tongue. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting rule. He will snatch you up and pluck you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see and fear. They will laugh at you, saying, here now is the man who did not make God his stronghold, but trusted in his great wealth and grew strong by destroying others. But I am like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. I trust in God's unfailing love forever and ever. 
For what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people. And I will hope in your name, for your name is good. That concludes our reading from Psalm 52, as well as my sermon. I invite you now, we're going to sing, uh, and Carol, I'm going to have you play this, this There's a Spirit in the Air for us through once, because this is an unfamiliar hymn, at least to me, and I'm not sure about to you. The, 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 uh, the words are good and the tune is easy, but I'm going to let play, Carol will play it through for us once, and then I invite you to stand and we'll sing it together. I'm going to use our epistle lesson as our call to prayer. Again, this is talking about, this is from the book of Hebrews, talking about Jesus as our high priest, contrasting them with human high priests, Jewish high priests. Uh, they don't have those anymore, but in the time of Jesus, they did, okay, and before. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but, but, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them, for us. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. Jesus, he, Jesus, sacrificed their sin, for their sins, for our sins, once for all when he offered himself on the cross. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weaknesses. But the oath, an oath from God, which came after the law, 
appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. Here ends the reading from the book of Hebrews that tells us that whatever our joys or concerns are, whatever the problems that we've had, whatever the sins that we've committed, that we can come to God through Jesus Christ as our high priest and find forgiveness and grace. Thanks be to God for that good news. And I, I invite you now to uh, share joys or concerns that you want to, to take to God in prayer this morning. I, I have one. Um, I got a call just before I was due to uh, uh, come to church from um, uh, a, a, a man who I grew up beside in Franklin. He was in tears. Um, I, the, the, Mark Ciso, he, uh, he's my brother's best friend and has worked with my brother for years. And Mark, Mark Ciso is in the uh, hospital in Beaumont just having found out he had just one little symptom. Turned out he has a tumor in his brain and cancer throughout his body. And he uh, called in tears. I told him I would visit him this afternoon. But, um, you know, I asked for prayers for him and his wife. I forget what his wife's name is. But uh, Mark Z, so. so um, and my brother Mark, too, because this will be a big, big loss, assuming it, it doesn't look good. So... Other joys or concerns, let us be in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this time to worship together, and we pray that your presence would be felt powerfully by those who are unable to join us in worship today because of their health. We lift particularly up Melda and Judy and others who come to mind, all those on our prayer list who who need your health, who need your help for their healing, for their, for their well-being. We pray for, for Maldiv due to be healed, and we pray for Rick's widow when, in, in her new widowhood, and we pray for Mark and his, Mark Ziso and his recent diagnosis of widespread cancer and his his unknowing what, not knowing what comes next, and we just pray that you would be with him for, for healing, for help. We pray also that you would be with Anne for healing from her most recent fall and all those who have fallen and recently uh, suffered, um, suffered wounds from that, including Carol and Todd. And Lord, we pray that that you as, as our, our help and stay would keep help keep us um, more on our feet as we age, um, because there's too many falls right now. And Lord, we, we pray. We pray for our nation in this time. We pray that you would guide uh, us, uh, guide our leaders, guide all who are deciding on our leaders, guide us as citizens and voters to, to uh, choose wisely and well. Lord, we pray that, that no matter what the outcome of, of elections here, that there will be peaceful, a peaceful transition of power and that our democracy will hold. Lord, we pray for all the leaders of the nations that you might lead them in the paths of righteousness and justice and peace because there is so much unrighteousness and injustice and war. Lord, we pray that you would help us each in our daily lives and bless and guide us and our families in the paths of righteousness. May we look to your son Jesus as our model of compassion and love. And we pray now in the words which Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Greg will lead us in the offertory prayer after which we will sing the doxology.
collection plates for our offerings are available in the back. And let's now please hear a prayer asking God's blessings on them. O oh God, we offer you all the good that is in us, though it be very small and imperfect. We pray only for the grace to give well, to help without patronizing, to assist without weakening, to share without diminishing the self-respect of others. Amen. Bless, preserve, comfort, and keep you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Let us join in saying, Let there be peace on earth, number 431.
Jesus.